All right, it is Thursday. It is seven o'clock. It is time for conversations with Commodores. And I know you guys see my guest over here. He is one of the more recognizable faces of the Vanderbilt program, particularly in the last 50 years. The tackling machine, number 34, Chris <laughs> Gaines. Hey, Chris, thanks for joining me, bud. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. I've been looking forward to this. Oh, I have been looking forward to this and so <laughs> many folks. And as they roll in, Chris, I'll tell you, if I recognize who they are and when they come in, I'll give you a second to say hello to them. Okay, awesome. And I can't imagine there's too many people watching this tonight who don't know who Chris is or the Gaines family in their importance to the Vanderbilt football community. Chris played in the mid 80s. Uh, his brother Brad was a couple of years behind. Brad was in my class. Both of them represented Vanderbilt so, so well th throughout the 80s. Thank brother you. Greg played at that other school down the street in, in east, yeah. east of us. <laughs> and is there a fourth Gaines brother? Who I never yes, met? there is. Yeah, four did, boys. Yeah. Did he play Jeff, ball as well? I never met him. Yeah, Jeff. So he was in between uh, Brad's youngest. I was the next. Jeff and then Greg. And Jeff was, I mean, you know, some people say the best athlete in the family. Several of us would disagree with that. But uh, <laughs> he, uh, he had scholarship offers and just did not want to go to school. So, you know, obviously he regrets that now, but, you know, very talented in football, baseball, and basketball. And so, yeah. Sure, sure. Well, guys, if you were around, around campus, if you were around Jess Neely Drive from the early 80s all the way through about 1990, you knew the Gaines family was there. The parents, everybody was there. Yes. Such an awesome family. Did everybody go to DuPont? Everybody went to DuPont. My dad and his two twin brothers went to DuPont. And so, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a special place for us. Awesome. Now, now, Chris, for folks who don't haven't caught up with you recently, tell folks, what are you doing these days professionally? Tell us a little bit about your family, and then we're going we're gonna to drop back to DuPont High School in a few minutes. Okay. Uh, I'm married uh, to my wife, Carol, for 33 years. We awesome. started dating when I was 16 years old and dated all through Vanderbilt. While I was at Vanderbilt, she went to MTSU and was in a nursing program there. And uh, we have two beautiful daughters that we've been blessed with. And Ashley is 31 and Shelby is 29. Shelby has a uh, two kids, uh, two years old and 10 weeks old. So we have two grandbabies. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, Ashley's married and the oldest and, and they're both doing well. And so things are going very well with the family. All right. I got to uh, ask, I got to ask, what's your grandpa name? <laughs> so it started out, I was going to be called G-Pop. Okay. Uh -huh. And it turned into Pop Pop. And now Mavery says Bop Pop. So I'm Bop Pop. Awesome. <laughs> and I like it. <laughs> awesome. That is so cool. Guys, I got Chris Gaines and Chris, in no particular order, OJ Fleming, Jim Aguiano. Okay. Oh, yeah. Billy Smith, Tony Piercy, Jeff Madden. They're just rolling in for you. Wow. Love it, man. Love it. Miss everybody. Yes. Great times. And, and real quick, Bernard, you asked about what I'm doing now. So uh, I'm retired and uh, been blessed to be able to be retired and spend time with the family. And both of my parents are still alive. So uh, thankful for that, able to spend a lot of time with them. And, and uh, I still do business. Uh, I was in medical for over 20 years, and uh, I was the CEO of a spine instrumentation company, mm -hmm. a French company. We specialized in scoliosis correction, and uh, I ran the U.S. subsidiary out of New York, mm -hmm. and so did a lot of traveling and flying and really grinding it for uh, about six years with that company. And then I retired from there in 2013 and started my own medical company, mm -hmm. uh, doing distribution of medical products. And then also 
we've done a lot of investing into developing products and uh, intellectual property and getting patents on products and stuff like that. Excellent. Excellent. All right. I got to ask one, how's your French and two, how's your French combined with your Tennessee dialect? Oh how- my you gotta, Man. you gotta share a little bit about that. Hey, what? Out of all the places, I'm in New York and France. So yeah, it was it was hilarious to say the least. But the French people, you know, we went there about four times a year, and you know, spent a lot of time there. Spent a lot of time with surgeons there, and and uh, the, about the only thing I got to where I could do is order a couple of foods off a menu. Other than that, I struggled, but they liked it. It was funny. They liked the accent and uh, it, it was a good time. Awesome. Well, I know you made the very best of it. And speaking of the very best of them, Henry Beelan is in the house. Man, hey, I love Henry Beelan. Uh, and we spent, we, we hung out up in the dorm room all the time. He, I don't know how he got a double room with no roommate, but he pulled it off. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I, he used to let me borrow his gold. I believe it was either a Trans Am or a Firebird. He can correct me, but he, I drove that thing all the time because my car was always broke down. <laughs> All right, Chris, we got to we got to drop back to DuPont. We got four Gaines brothers, all athletic. There's all kind of stuff. There's not a lot of sitting around the house. How did mom and dad referee what was inevitable? We'll just call them disagreements amongst the brothers. Well, the buck stopped with our dad. So we knew, you know, we didn't have a lot of disagreements inside the house where when he was around. Uh, outside the house, we had our share. Uh, but uh, no, we, we were tight and we didn't really have a lot of, you know, just your normal little kid arguments growing up, but nothing really major, surprisingly. Well, with, with Greg and Jeff being the older brothers, Talk about the, the, the tone they set for you and Brad when it came to school, when it came to, to social, when it came to athletics. What were they, how were they for you guys as the older brothers? Yeah, I mean, it, it, was, it, it was great, great examples and great, you know, being able to see, you know, Greg, we were all like three years apart. So mm-hmm. we watched Greg in junior high and high school. And then when he left, Jeff was playing. And then when Jeff left, which I didn't get to play with Jeff, Mm -hmm. I came in, Brad and I didn't play together in high school, and then he came in. So, you know, to be able to have those examples, older brothers that, you know, were loved sports and, you know, wanted to excel and, you know, wanted to to play on teams that did well and contribute to that, uh, it was it was a lot of fun. It was very motivating. So, you know, I felt like from an early age, I knew what I wanted to do and I was focused on that. And what, what programs, what schools did you guys root for when you were growing up? I mean, man, I was a huge Tennessee fan. I mean, for, you know, up until (laughs) I went to school to Vanderbilt and, uh, yeah, I was, I would go, you know, I remember Bernard King and Ernie Grunfeld, and, you know, Greg playing up there and ha- having pictures made with them and going to all the ball games. Greg would send home the old, you know, tearaway jerseys that they wore. And, mm-hmm. you know, so yeah, Tennessee was it for me. And then I started getting into, you know, I really liked Vanderbilt basketball. Mm-hmm. You know, back in the day, Fear Fosnes Ford and all Tommy Springer and all them guys. So, you know, other than that, that was it for me. Well, then that's I want to I want to talk to about your junior high going into high school uh, okay. football experience and then starting to be recruited. Because if you're growing up a UT fan and you got an older brother who went through the program and then made it to the, to the professional ranks. How difficult of a decision was it for you when Vanderbilt and maybe a bunch of other schools started coming around and saying, hey, we we want to talk to you? It, it was difficult. Uh, you know, when I – so uh, in junior high, ninth grade, I was a quarterback. 
Mm -hmm. uh, when I went to high school, I was a quarterback. Come again, say that again. Quarterback. Your yeah. position, but no. That's right. Yes. That's right. Yes. I, I don't know if many people know that, if they know Not your history. Not many people know that. <laughs> and here's what's even <laughs> real crazy. Uh, so, uh, went to DuPont as a sophomore, started at quarterback. Mm -hmm. Junior year, started at quarterback. Didn't play defense. Mm -hmm. uh, senior year. First game, quarterback, we were struggling, moving and moving the ball. And at halftime, the head coach moves me to tailback. And humbly, I had 230-something yards or whatever in that second half, and I played tailback the rest of the way. Mm -hmm. And I played some defensive end because at, I was, you know, bigger than most of the kids. You know, I was 215 in high school and at a local – you know, public school like that, you know, our linemen were 185, 190 uh, back in the day. So I played some defensive end, but I was, you know, quarterback, played tailback my senior year, return punts and kickoffs and all that stuff. So never had played linebacker before. You know, Chris, I'm trying to get a visual of you playing quarterback. It's like it to me, <laughs> it's like when Whit Taylor lined up against Auburn at free safety. Yeah. I don't know if you knew that or remembered that, but he played at least one full game at free safety against no. Auburn before he came over to, to, to full time quarterback. But anyway, I did not know that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm desperately trying to find some video or some photos of Whit being in the safety position. But talk to us a little bit about the recruiting process. Who was who was hot for you, and what schools were on your radar? Well, uh, I, the five official visits I took that you know I was offered scholarships was Tennessee, Vanderbilt, Alabama, LSU, Texas A&M. So that's that's who I was choosing from, mm -hmm. and. Uh, Tennessee, you know, I remember the recruiting trip like it was yesterday. My brother, you know, Greg at the time, uh, you know, he, he, he wasn't, he didn't like Tennessee a whole lot. He had, you know, some stuff going on there. And, mm -hmm. and so I, at the time, was coming through and on my recruiting visit, I remember uh, Johnny Majors, you know, he had all the recruits there. We're at some kind of uh, uh, viewing one of the going on a tour and he comes up pulls me aside and says I want you to go with me and uh, we got in his car we went I'll never forget we went and got his dry cleaning he took me to his house to meet his wife and then eventually we joined back and you know jumped back in there and you know I really liked him and felt like you know it would be a good place for me to play, but I wanted to go to Vanderbilt. Uh, my girlfriend, who is now my wife, that played a big part of it. I wanted to be here. Uh, the education at Vanderbilt was very attractive to me, and I felt like you go there and you do what you're supposed to do and do well to create a lot of opportunities for you, which it's been a blessing to me. It's done that. And uh, – if I were going to, to another school, the decision was between Vanderbilt and Alabama for me. Uh, I had a really good visit there. Uh, Bear Bryant had, was on his way out. Mm -hmm. uh, they take us into his office. My parents meet him. He signed a picture of there was uh, Greg was uh, when Tennessee was playing Alabama. He had made a tackle and they had a picture of it. And he signed that and he wrote on a note for me he said Chris uh may the sun always shine upon you I hope you play for Bama something like that mm -hmm. and so and then he passed away he dated it and everything and then he passed away and then you know Ray Perkins was there you know had a really good relationship with him uh, Ken Donahue the old defensive coordinator, he's the one that recruited me. And I, I really think my dad would have liked for me to go to Alabama. Mm -hmm. uh, but Vanderbilt was the place for me, and it became evident to me, and I just I, – I wouldn't change that decision for anything. Who recruited you? Who was your, your recruiting coach? Donnie Sherman. Coach Sherman. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, great guy. Just a great guy and just easy to get along with. And yeah, we had a good time. At, at that time, as a high school senior, you you know some of the other players in the metro area. I know you made different teams and recognitions. Were you starting to get to know some of those guys and knowing where they were going? And were there any any of them coming to Vanderbilt in your recruiting class? Yeah, and actually that year uh, was a big uh, recruiting class for Vanderbilt from Nashville. You know, uh, Goo Baby, Daryl Holt, uh, Kenny Weatherspoon. Uh, you'll remember Brian Wilkerson was from Mount Juliet. Uh, mm -hmm. He played safety. Uh, uh, Eric Harmon was from Lebanon. I mean, there were a lot of – a lot of kids from Nashville. So that was neat, you know, to be able to, you know, go to school with a lot of local guys too. And Greg didn't hold it against you that you went to Vanderbilt, did he? No, no. And you know what? It, I mean, it's always been great. But yeah, yeah, just support for each other. And mm -hmm. he loves his school. I love mine. And uh, it, it, it hadn't been too bad as far as the rivalry <laughs> goes. <laughs> and what, what kind of impression at this point, Brad, who's my year, came in, he and I were in the same recruiting class three years later. What kind of impression? He's a ninth grader going into 10th grade. You committing and signing at Vanderbilt, what kind of impression did that have on Brad? Well, uh, Brad and I are really close. So, you know, I think that was a, a big factor, and I'm glad it was because, you know, I, I loved that time. We had a great time together, and, you know, we're able to help each other by being supportive, you know. Uh, talk to each other after every practice and games. And so that was awesome for him. I think his, you know, his official visit, one was to Ole Miss, one was to Tennessee, one was to BYU, one was to Texas. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he had some tremendous opportunities and, and chose Vanderbilt. So it, I never even thought of him going any other place, really. Mm -hmm. So it worked out really well. And, and your folks got to get take off the orange and put on the black and gold for the next seven, eight years after that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I think my dad's black and gold. I think his blood bleeds back black and gold. Mom, I'm not so sure. <laughs> that, that's great. Well, moms, moms are never going to choose a favorite. They're never that's gonna right. Choose. But speaking of one of my favorites, Jason Smith has joined us and says to tell you hello. Wow. Hello, Jason. Yes, absolutely. I remember Jason. Well, let's let's talk a little bit about coming in, leaving DuPont. Now you're coming into big time, not the DuPont wasn't, but high school is high school. Yeah. Now you're transitioning up to the collegiate level. You're in the best conference in the country. When you were coming in that freshman fall, had it been determined what position you were going to compete for? What was going on from that standpoint? Yeah. Uh, I, yes, it had been determined. I, they were going to make me a fullback, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I wasn't for SEC. Really, I wasn't elusive and fast enough and all that to be a tailback. I knew that, but I felt like I had the size and strength to be a fullback, and that's where they wanted me to play. They didn't even mention – linebacker or any other position so I came in as a freshman and it, when you ask that question the first thing that comes to my mind it's real interesting as we all know you, you suddenly and will quickly see how different it is the size of everybody the speed everybody's good whereas in a lot of local public high schools you know you might have two or three good players and you know, when you're exposed to that much talent, it's a whole different ball game. But when I, uh, before uh, we had arrived on campus as freshmen, uh, Ken Hudgens, who used to be at Vanderbilt, was a great friend, family friend, just a great guy. He said, you need to start going over there and working out with Doc Crease and, you know, getting, getting this thing going. And I remember Norman Jordan, they had just finished the big season. And Norman, he uh, he asked me if I wanted to run, go for a run with him, and do a do a workout. And man, it was more of a distance run than anything. And you know, at that age, I hadn't done a lot of distance running. 
And I could just tell then, man, you know, this is going to be different. The training's going to be different. The speed of the game, everything's going to be different. So, yeah, so that was, uh, you know, getting prepared for that freshman year and, and, and trying to, you know, focus on the things now being a fullback on things that I felt like I was going to need to do to be successful. It was interesting. Talk a little bit about Coach Mack and his influence and your relationship with him. Huge influence. And, and, you know, you hear this and everybody, just a phenomenal man, just a great man. You, you could just tell, you know, at that time I didn't know, but you could just tell he would be a great father, a great parent, mm -hmm. to me a Christian example. And he just exemplified what a man should be. Mm -hmm. And uh, – so very impressive, and I always loved him. And, uh, you know, I was looking forward to playing for him. And, and to a man, have said, whenever I've asked that question, whether it's here in the show or offline, tell me about Coach Mack. I've never heard one bad thing. I've heard no. nothing but compliments across the board. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just, yeah. I mean, I, that, that, that's really all I think about when I think about him, you know, just how good of a person he was and, you know, a very successful coach and, you know, had a long coaching career and obviously, you know, did it the right way or he wouldn't have been around for so long. Yeah, no, you're, you're very right. Now, Chris, where did you live freshman year? Which hall or which dorm? Man, Branscombe. And uh, I can, uh, you know, most, I can still remember where everybody was and who mm -hmm. their roommate was. Mm -hmm. uh, and Mark Whaler was my roommate, uh, Cuckoo. That's what we ended up calling him, Cuckoo. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, it, it was just a great time. And it's interesting because I, I, I – I just thought of this. I, I actually talked to on the phone, Jim Blondell, mm -hmm. if you guys remember Jim, and I have not talked to Jim since I left school or, or since he left Vanderbilt. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he, uh, academically, he, he mm -hmm. failed out and went on to Illinois and did very, very well. We later saw each other at the blue gray game. Uh, but I had not talked to him on the phone since then. And we reconnected about three or four weeks ago. So that was a lot of fun. I just remember he and I got to be really good friends as a freshman. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember his roommate was Buster Gant. You remember Buster? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, I love Branscombe. Uh, Miss P, Miss Palmer in the food oh, yeah. line. Yeah. I mean, it was just awesome, man. Well, I'm, I'm coming back to the blue-gray game in a minute because I got some good stories that you don't probably even know. But we're going to yeah. save freshman year. And they, okay. During most of the 80s and probably into the 90s, I think freshmen live, freshman football players and probably all freshman athletes lived in Lupton, third, fourth, fifth floors, whatever. And I lived in Lupton, part of the Branscombe Quadrangle. It's great, yes. right in the middle of campus, not too far of a walk over to McGugan. But sometimes – for me, that five to seven minute walk was an eternity, especially if you're sore, <laughs> if you're tired. Yeah. I want to ask you about your, about those, because those to me, Chris, that's a part of my freshman experience. That walk from the out of Branscombe over to McGugan seemed as, as we went through fall camp. Oh, good. To get longer and longer and longer of a walk, even though it wasn't a quarter mile or whatever. Yeah. It was. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, I got the same feeling, and uh, and even classes, uh, you know, uh, it, it just seemed like it took forever to get there. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, no, I can sympathize with that. I, I that's the same memories I have. <laughs> what was it about the collegiate game? You you hinted on it just a minute ago about the training. You're now it, it's it's different. It's of yeah. course it's different. It's SEC. It's college. It's much yeah. much much more. But let's talk about the transition on the field. You've always been gifted, been gifted athletically, but everybody Thank else you. around you is. Thank you. From a mental standpoint, not just physical, but from yeah. a mental standpoint, talk about the transition as that freshman, you're getting to learn your position, you're competing with others, 
where in the past you've always been one of the top dogs. Now you really got some competition coming in as a freshman. Yeah, well, for me coming in as a fullback, and you know, I remember getting that playbook. And like I said, as a quarterback in high school, I mean, we literally had four or five plays. Mm -hmm. I mean, we ran a bootleg where I ran it or, or threw it, and uh, we ran a couple of power plays, and then I'd do quarterback sneaks. And you know, that was really about it. So, as far as a fullback and picking up blitzes and zone reads and hots and codes and I had no idea yeah. I mean and it that part was a struggle and you know as we all know when you're thinking and you don't understand and know it it, it when it's not instinctive for you to move and go where you're supposed to go mm -hmm. it your, your play uh, suffers big time and so you know, I felt like I was, you know, I felt physically, I felt like fullback was a great fit, but catching on to everything in, in that short period of time, because they're getting ready for fall ball. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you're not getting a lot of reps. And so it, that was tough. That was, was tough. Gonna, I was going to say mentally, how was that trying to adjust to that? learning the offense, trying to establish yourself from an athletic standpoint, that's for most freshmen, almost all freshmen, it, that's, a, that's a real climb right there. Was it frustrating at times? Did you have any self-doubt or did you just put your head down and just kept plowing ahead? I didn't have any self-doubt. I put my head down, kept plowing ahead. And, you know, the blessing looking back on that, I mean – just the I, I, my running back coach was Dave Roberts, mm -hmm. and we called him. Everybody called him Fireball. He was tough, and he was. I'll never forget uh, when we would finish practice, he'd go in the weight room, and he did it pretty much every day. They would load four oh five on the bench, and he would do it, and then he would do a set of dips, and that was it. Uh, but strong and tough. But anyway, uh, everybody remembers Billy Rolfe. Billy Rolfe was a fullback. And me and Billy Rolfe, Buster Gant, Greg Williams, mm -hmm. uh, remember Greg Williams? I kid you not, Coach Roberts would take us out in the backfield before practice, mm -hmm. after practice, Sometimes I thought it was even on game day when we wasn't playing and we would we would do uh, ISOs and just five yards apart and just continuously just run into each other. So as a fullback, uh, uh, you know, a lot of your plays are isolation blocks on the linebackers. Yeah. So one of us was a fullback, one of us was a linebacker, and, you know, they talk about all the concussion stuff now. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I had headaches every day. Mm -hmm. So, anyway, but, yeah, that part of it, the mental part of the playbook and, and playing, a, especially playing a position you have never played mm -hmm. was very, very challenging. And then the move to linebacker, which I had never played, then you start into – more hurdles so when when did you transition to linebacker so red shirt in my freshman year spring of my freshman year they moved me to linebacker well, so guys, I, 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 for the guys who've known you say in the last 20 years or so you've been known as a former player as a strength and conditioning coach and a fellow who is just a, a great teammate and friend but what you. i but what i want you to share a little bit about chris where did you develop the, the love of strength and conditioning and working out? That's A lot of that is not typically going to be found on a high level in high school. Did you have it in high school or did it develop as, as you got to campus? I'm going to tell you when it started. It started when I was 13 years old. Mm -hmm. I started working out and I would work out every morning in the basement of our house. My dad got us some weights. I would go down there before school after school, like seriously working out at 13. Mm -hmm. I would set my alarm clock in the middle of the night to take supplements. My dad would buy supplements out of a magazine. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. he would order them and I would take desiccated liver to gain weight, brewer's yeast and (laughs) just stuff. And, And I was just so into trying to get bigger and trying to get stronger for football. That's what I was doing it for. So I, it is kind of different and unique to do it at that start at that age. But I did it all through high school. I didn't, I didn't go out and party and do all that. I, I wanted to try to get better. That's what I did. So. And, and clearly, clearly it, it paid off for you from a standpoint of being physically fit from being having just from a leverage standpoint, whether yeah. it's a back or, or when you transition to linebacker. And I think it was infectious. And what I mean by that is when there were guys in the weight room who were kind of on the borderline of whether they really wanted to be there or felt that there was benefits and they look over and, and see you doing what you do, you can't help but just feel man, I need to get, I need to start doing some of that. So this is my way of just telling you, Chris, of the fine example that you Thank set you. by just doing. Because the the two years you and I were teammates, I don't remember you ever being a big yeller or screamer or getting in people's face. No. It was by example. And to me, those are some of the very best of leaders because you can do this all day long. Yeah, yeah. But if you're not leading by example, then people are really going to question, you know, what kind of leadership do you have? So, so I, I say that as a compliment, but I have a question to follow with that. Okay. You redshirt freshman year. I assume this is your time to get adjusted academically, football wise, et cetera. You're now going into sophomore year. And when let's talk about the transition to linebacker. Well, Who had that okay. talk with you? What was that about? Watson Brown had that talk with me. Mm-hmm. Uh, I believe, or it might have still been, uh, I tell you what, I think it was Kurt Van Balkenberg. Mm-hmm. Remember Kurt Van Balkenberg, the defensive coordinator? He, he was with the, the administration with Coach Mack. Watson, if you remember, came in in the fall, the winter of 85, leading yes. into the spring of 86. Yes. So it was Kurt Van Balkenberg. And uh, he just felt like, you know, he wanted defensive players. He had watched me as my freshman year as a fullback. He said, you know, I think you should be a linebacker. And Mm -hmm. I was all for it. I was willing to do it. What happened, though, that was another setback. That spring, they moved me to linebacker. And humbly, you know, I was catching on and having some success in in scrimmages. And and, – we were doing a live kickoff coverage in spring practice, which is a no-no. I mean, and that's when I had that severe ankle injury and uh, double fibula fracture, complete dislocation, and the medial deltoid ligament was severed in two. And uh, it was a brutal injury, and it still is even today. But I, I remember I had that surgery, and I – I tell this story sometimes. The only time I've ever seen tears in my dad's eyes is when Pinky Lipscomb at the hospital, he said, Mr. Gaines, I don't know if your son will be able to play football again with this ankle. Because back then, you know, I mean, they put you together the best they could. And, of course, medicine technology's changed so much today. But anyway, I came back, Doc Crease, I'll never forget. So Glenn Watson, I don't know, uh, people will remember Glenn, but you were a little, you were uh, after that, Bernard. He uh, he was a defensive end from Texas, and I believe he was like a senior or junior when I was a freshman. He had had the same type injury. And Doc Crease got these special Adidas high top boots blue boots with the three stripes on them and they had the little turf treads on the bottom Mm -hmm. and after I had my surgery and started rehabbing he put me in them things and started working me and I'll never forget uh, he had me carrying Jim Drawley and Bill Fletcher offensive linemen doing sprints with them on my back I was he had me doing stadium steps and I've one of the pictures I love is I, 
after one of those workouts, I'm just bent over the rail, just, you know, sweating. And it was, I remember that workout, but uh, yeah. So coming back from that and already moving to a new position, I ended up playing in the, the fourth game, I believe, is when we played Alabama the following year, fourth yeah. or fifth game. The fall, that was that was eighty. the season of 84. That's okay. the big game where you all upset them for homecoming, broke a big streak. Yes, and I actually, I think, got – I think I played some special teams in that game. And so I had, from the spring to the fourth game of the fall, I had come back from that ankle injury wow. and started – working myself back into it and then uh after that you know I just seemed to I loved playing linebacker I I just loved it I was ate up with it it's like I mean this was my position so Chris was there anybody who you tried to pattern your your game after in the collegiate or pro level uh when you were transitioned over to linebacker did anybody impress you with the way they played uh, yeah, but, you know, I always loved Mike Singletary. I just, you know, I, I love the way he played. You know, he was a shorter linebacker like I was. Mm -hmm. And uh, just his tenacity and toughness. And, and, and I love the old Dick Bus Buckus, you know, films and watching all that. But, you know, I admired my older brother, Greg, because, mm -hmm. you know, he really didn't have – great speed or even great size he was really you know tall six three six four but uh he was just so tough and played so hard and you know something he always said he said look you don't have to be the fastest but you got you, you got to have great footwork you have to stay on your feet and that was a that always stuck with me you know if you stay on your feet if stuff's coming at you, if they're cut blocking you, if you can stay off your feet, you can make more plays. So, you know, I always admired the way he played the game. Well, you picked three of the very best. And I'll tell you, I've told many people over the years, I always thought your game was patterned after Singletary. It was the intensity. It was the eyes. It was the Thank ability you. to just stay on your feet, go laterally or wherever you needed to be. And for those of you who don't know, I'm, as I said earlier, I came in with, with Brad three years after, after Chris's class. We came in in the, the spring of, excuse me, the fall of 86. I had the pleasure of playing scout team. And by this point, Chris is on the other side. And I, <laughs> oh, man, when, it, when it rains or gets really cold in Birmingham, you're one of the people I have to thank when I'm thinking about why is this body part aching a little bit? <laughs> no, oh, Chris, I, I will say this in all fairness. And you guys all already know this, whether it was in a game or in practice, Chris would knock your block off, but then he'd pick you up, pat you on the butt, and tell you to get back after it. Every let's time. do it again. Yeah, let's right. do it again. Right. Well, Chris, let's talk about success playing the linebacker position that first year. You're getting used to it, but you, you really are, are starting to develop it. What position were you playing? Who were the fellow linebackers in that core with you? Talk a little bit about those experiences from a game yeah. standpoint. Uh, it was, uh, you know, when I was younger, that when they moved me to middle linebacker, they called it Mike linebacker. And the Sam linebacker was a guy named Jeff Cartwright. Mm -hmm. uh, Jeff Cartwright. And then, you know, you also had uh, Jeff McFerrin. I don't know if you guys remember him. They used to call him Rockhead. He was, he was a tough <laughs> linebacker. So he was in there. He was a really good player. And then younger guys, Armando Fitz, you know, was yeah. there. And so uh, Mac McCarroll, remember Mac McCarroll? Mm -hmm. Mac was playing linebacker. So, yeah, so it was – I was a middle linebacker, and I think, you know, I, I, I always played middle linebacker, never really played outside. Uh, they would move me outside some in, like, the bear defense. But, yeah, I was a true middle linebacker. So, a lot, uh, I remember one spring we moved to a 4-3. So, really, you're playing one middle linebacker and two outside guys. So, that's what I played. And you're so busy as we all were back then with the sport, especially during the season. You're so regimented. You've got to get your schoolwork done. 
you got meetings, you got rest, you got workouts. It's a very routine, albeit very packed schedule. With your then girlfriend, now wife at MTSU being about 45 minutes or so away. Yeah. How often were you able to, to socialize? How often were you able to see family during the, during the season uh, time period? Not during the spring when we had a little more time off, but during yeah. the spring. How did you balance all that? During the season, really, just for the games, Carol would come to all the games with my parents. And so I would see my parents, you know, living so close. A uh, great friend of mine went to the same school together who's a year behind me, Dwayne Jones. Uh, so Dwayne and I, you know, we grew up we pretty close to each other around here. So, uh, you know, we would go go home i'd go over their house uh, lucy could cook some food man so we i ate there all the time doug and lucy doug would always be asleep in the lazy boy <laughs> but uh and then we would go to his grandparents uh Dwayne's, uh grandfather and grandmother we would eat over there and then of course my house i mean i'd go home every chance i got because my mom would cook all the time so you know, it's, it's so beautiful that you had a way to a place to escape that was yeah. so close. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I was 400 miles from home. There was no, there was no easy trips going home. Yeah. That was, that I, yeah. was good for you guys. Yeah. I've always thought about that, how difficult and challenging that had to be for people and just, you know, being homesick and, you know, no, you know, you couldn't really back then, even phone calls, you know, long distance call, it was just hard. You know, you just that? didn't have the money. Chris, three weeks after I graduated high school, I, I came up to Nashville uh, summer of 86. I wanted to take a class to kind of get used to school a little bit. And I just had a little elbow surgery, wanted to rehab with Norwig and that crew. Yeah. Who's the first first football player I meet when I check in and go to my dorm room and is my next door neighbor, Chuck DeGroot. Oh, <laughs> Chicago. Yeah. Chuck yeah. ended up, I mean, we got along just fine, but you, you know, he was not much of a welcoming committee. So that was no. my, my introduction to Vanderbilt and, and college a little bit. No, Chuck was tough, man. I liked old Chuck. Yeah. Oh, he was, he was tough, but he was, he was a good dude, but I, I want to, yeah. I want to talk a little bit about, I want to kind of skip a little bit to the, to the 87 season. You had such a very special season, and I will never forget to me, the all-time single greatest single game performance was at Tulane. Unfortunately, it was a loss. Yeah, yeah. But you said, you're still tackling people. It was, I think, registered. You, you were credited for 37 tackles, but I think it was probably closer to 47 on the game. But I've never seen an individual that locked in on either side of the field. What do you remember about that game? Well, I was sick that we lost that game. I mean, you know, uh, what I remember about that game is I knew uh, I, I needed to make a lot of plays because they ran the option. Terrence Jones was the option quarterback and a That's heck a of oh, yeah. heck of a player. And they had a, a really good receiver, Mark Zeno. I remember that. I think both of them, you know, had opportunities to play at the next level. I don't know if it worked out or not. But uh, – and I just remember, you know, my senior year, I played every special team. I played – I covered punts, kickoffs, punt return, kickoff return. So – and I remember that game, I made a lot of tackles on special teams. Uh, but I just remember how much running it was because, you know, the outside veer, the option, and, you know, if, if it wasn't give, if they wasn't giving it to the fullback, the next level quarterback pitch, it's just, you're just running nonstop. So I just remember that, uh, you know, I knew that game was going to take a special effort and I had to be prepared mentally and conditioned physically to be able to, to you know, do that. You, you were already on the map as far as SEC, but I really think that was your stamp, that particular game. 
The other thing, Chris, that I remember is Stump Johnson ran back a kickoff return. Yes. Touchdown. Yes, game. Stump. Yes, he was good at that. He was. Yeah. He was. Let's talk a little bit about Brad, just for a few minutes. What yeah. was it like playing on the same team with Brad for a couple of seasons? Man, it it, it was awesome. Loved it. Now he didn't like it. Uh, he didn't like our drills when I was playing linebacker and he was playing running back. I was going he, there, but you you go ahead. <laughs> I, he still tell. I think I, I separated his shoulder, dislocated it or something. But you know, I went hard. He, as tight as we are, man, I went hard against him, even harder, really, just to, you know, prepare him and and just you know it. But the practices and, and games and just the time we were able to spend, it was awesome, you know, eating dinner. And then, you know, when you get back to your room at night at that age, you know, 30 minutes after dinner, you're hungry again. We would order pizzas and go across the street and get food and just very supportive and were able to share things that you know is bothering you that's you know we're all going through and it, it was it was a blessing it was good you know I was always not I wouldn't say jealous I was always a little envious maybe of your relationship with having both of y'all on campus at least for two years together yeah. I had a, a, I still have a younger brother he was at Swanee a couple of years behind me he played for a couple of years good school but, yeah Great school, but yeah. not on campus. Too far away to to really hang out like you guys yeah. got to. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, though, yeah, I wouldn't trade those days for anything. Yeah, that was good stuff, guys. This is all good stuff. I'm talking with Chris Gaines, of course. We got a few more minutes. I want to welcome. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, Russell Nicole is with us. Hey, Russell. We got Kenny Cole. Let's see, Tyler Chastain. We, uh, I don't know if I mentioned Mad Dog Madden is in the house. Mad Dog, strength coach extraordinaire. And he's also next week's guest. So I'm so oh, wow. on that one. That'll be good. That yeah, will be good. Oh, we got so many good ones lined up. Chris, let's talk a little bit about Watson Brown. When yeah. Watson came in, as we all know, Coach was the quarterback when they beat Alabama in 69. He was a hero ever since then. He came back to school and was offensive coordinator for a season or two. But in the fall of 85, Coach Mack is no longer with the program. It's a homecoming. Watson is named the coach. That was – I was fortuitous, and that was my recruiting class. I was in yes. his first, along with Brad and many others, in his yes. first class. Talk a little bit about your relationship with Coach uh, Watson and and trying to get to, to know him a little bit more uh, now as the head coach of the team. You know, uh, I, I got a lot of respect for Watson and had a great relationship with him. And, you know, I think he uh, I think he I felt like he demanded a lot out of me and I wanted to perform for him. So I always think it's awesome when you got a coach that you respect and you do, do not want to disappoint. That's what it's all about. That's when you become as good as you can possibly be. So, you know, I had a great relationship with him, never had, you know, a lot of times you, you hear about, you know, conflicts or issues with players and coaches, but always never had any trouble and just, you know, really respected him and as a coach and a person. Let's, let's, who was your position coach or coaches during his administration? So it was originally Bryant Poole, mm -hmm. uh, came from Texas A&M, oh, Alabama, you know, just, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, tough coach. And uh, I ended up with Bob Campiglia, uh, and I loved him, man, absolutely loved him. And, you know, I credit him with uh, – he gave me the best advice that uh, I could ever get, and it really – it paid off for me, and uh, it wasn't the direction I was really focused on, but it ended up being what I needed to do. And that way, he called me in before my senior year, and he said, Chris, look, he said, you cannot come off the field. You have to be on the field every play. You're going to play special teams. You've got to play every play. And in order to do that, you got to be in the best shape that you've ever been in. So I took it to heart. Now, I, I normally played at about 240. 
I went in that year at 2.30. I, I ran twice a day. I did distance work every morning with my older brother, Greg, uh, early in the morning. And then in the afternoons, I do sprint work. Mm -hmm. Did a lot of ab work. Just tried to get in the best shape. And, and my focus for that season and in practice, and this is what I did, I was going to run to the ball on every play and not stop until I got there. So if they threw a 30-yard pass down the field to Boo Mitchell or Carl Parker, or, I, I would run and touch them, and then I would run back to the huddle. And that trained me during the games to never stop on a play. And probably one of the most things I'm proud of, Bernard, that means a lot to me is my senior year, as we know, the SEC, how tough it is. You know, linebacker, it's a very physical, active position. I didn't miss one play my senior year. So I credit that to him because he motivated me to do that, and it really helped me. Coach Campy, he was beloved by by all the players, even those who didn't play for him. Yes, loved him. Absolutely. It. Well, Chris, yeah. your 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 training, your persistence, your dedication, it clearly paid off. You had a phenomenal season, set all kind of tackling records that may even still be records today for Vanderbilt and in the SEC. But then it led to postseason recognitions. Growing up in Dothan, about 100 miles south of Montgomery on Christmas Day, during the 80s, we would always go to the Blue-Gray game, particularly the years I was playing, so I'd see my teammates. Yeah. So I was there when you and Everett Crawford represented Vanderbilt. Yeah. Now, I want to take you to the end of the game. You get recognized for what at the end of the game? Uh, MVP. And they gave you a trophy that was how big? Well, it was – the biggest one that had ever been in our house. And my, my older brother, he had this big old trophy, and that one topped it. And so I was excited about that. But what <laughs> happened when you went to hold up that trophy oh, that you gosh. were recognized? It crumbled. It, it literally fell apart piece by piece on national TV or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what to do. I couldn't believe it. Chris, I'm, I'm about 30 <laughs> yards away from you guys. I'm going crazy because that's my teammate. He just got the MVP. I'm taking pictures. I have pictures of that trophy crumbling in your hands that I'm going to find, and I'll post them and send them to you. Oh, man, that would be awesome. Because, <laughs> yeah, that was uh, – that was a fun game. It was great being there with Everett. And, uh, you know, what I remember about that game, uh, I was so disappointed because I, did, I wasn't going to start in that game. And not because I wasn't starting, but I wanted to have an opportunity to try to showcase myself and do the best I could for the scouts. Well, Jeff Harrod from Ole Miss, great mm -hmm. linebacker. Mm -hmm. good player and uh, he started and I don't know how much I would have I would have played obviously but I don't know how much he got hurt early on in the game mm -hmm. and I just I, I made the best of that opportunity you know I just well, played you, hard and did what I could do well you certainly caught the eyes of the NFL because you get drafted and yeah. you spent you spent some time with the Cardinals and the Dolphins and then CFL and we don't have to go too far down that road. Sure. We only have a few more minutes. Yeah. But what was it like being a guy from Vanderbilt, getting drafted, and now trying to make your way in the professional ranks? Did people give you a hard time coming from a smart school, or how did they deal with you with that? Yeah, they gave me a hard time until in rookie camp, you know, when they, they mess with everybody, and you got to get up, and they have uh, – entertainment night and I came out in overalls or a straw hat and sang uh, the Beverly Hillbillies. <laughs> <laughs> so they called me Jethro. <laughs> oh, that's, that's so funny. That's, so but good, yeah, uh... no, it, it was awesome. It was a dream come true. And I mean, you know, that was the goal and uh, you know, to get a great education and play professional football. And so I was able to thankfully 
accomplish those and just great blessings that I'll cherish forever. You know, the, the one of the, the realities for all athletes, regardless of what you've accomplished or regardless of how long you've played a sport, Father Time catches up and we have to recognize sometimes begrudgingly, sometimes voluntarily, it's time to hang them up. And I know that at one point you got, you got injured in the CFL, but do you remember that time period when you recognized it was now time to close this chapter and move to my next chapter in life and, and leave the sport that has uh, so much been a part of your life for so long? Yeah, and I remember it, you know, like it was yesterday because, you know, uh, humbly I was having a really good season. That was the Grey Cup season, and uh, we had a really good team, and we had the new owners, John Candy, the comedian, Wayne Gretzky, Bruce McNall, a lot of hype. They treated us incredibly well. But during that season, that ankle that I'd hurt at Vanderbilt, I mean – you know, practice every day was just brutal for me getting ready for practice and, and trying to recover after practice. And I already had, it was arthritic and I had osteoporosis bone on bone. And mm -hmm. the team doctor just said, Chris, look, I mean, you need to get out of the game because you're going to struggle when you get older. So I thought about it, prayed about it, made the decision to announce my retirement at the end of the season. Mm -hmm. uh what's cool about that Bernard and what led me into what I ended up doing next is we were in the downtown Toronto Grey Cup championship parade you know mm -hmm. equivalent to the Super Bowl in Canada big parade all the fans everybody there we're riding on you know er, you know waving and seeing everybody and John Candy comes up to me pulls me aside takes me into this tavern right there on King Street in Toronto, one of the main streets. I'll never forget it. Sits me down, sits down with me across from me. He said, Chris, let me, what do you want to do? You know, what are your plans? What, what, what do you want your future to be like? And I said, well, I love strength and conditioning. I want to go back to Vanderbilt. And one day my goal is to be the head strength coach there. He said, how about I make you the first full-time strength coach in Canadian football history? And I couldn't believe it. I mean, number one, for him to do that was unbelievably nice. And, you know, four or five, six of us had gotten close with him. He, on away games, he'd fly in, call us, and meet us for dinner. Just phenomenal person. Loved that guy. Same as he was, funny, would crack you up. But anyway, that led me into strength and conditioning. So I did that in the 92 season. And I came home in the off season and I said, you know what? I'm going to call Paul Houlihan, athletic director. And I called him up and set up a meeting, put on suit and tie, went over and met with him. And I told him, I said, look, my goal is to someday be the head strength coach at Vanderbilt. And he said, well, I'll give you an assistant strength coach position and we'll see how it goes. Mm -hmm. uh, Kelvin Clark was the head strength coach. Mm -hmm. And so I came in there and I don't know, it was six months. Or I just worked hard, you know, did my thing and just, you know, tried to get better and better and better. And uh, Jerry Donardo uh, called me in and said, Hey, I want to make you the head strength coach. So, uh, that's what I ended up doing. I thoroughly enjoyed it. How many seasons were you able to hold into that position? I started 92. I left there in 97. So I think I was the head strength coach, uh, 94 through 97, mm -hmm. uh, through 96, either 93 through 96 or 94 through 96, 97, Woody Woodenhofer got the head coaching job. And he said, Chris, he said, I want you to coach on the field. I want you to be the linebackers coach. Mm -hmm. So he hired, which I loved that too. I mean, I loved both of them. So I wanted to take advantage of that opportunity. It's a tremendous opportunity. So I coached inside linebackers. Norm Parker coached outside linebackers, and he was the defensive coordinator. So it was helpful to him. 
and uh, I absolutely loved it, loved recruiting, and uh, that was a great time. I was going to say, working for such a legendary former Pittsburgh Steelers defensive Yes, mind, yes. I bet that was a cool learning experience. Yeah, I mean, as we – he was brilliant. He was unbelievable as an X and O play-calling defensive coach. Mm -hmm. As good as you're going to get, in my opinion, and I've been around a lot, you've been around a lot, he, he just had it. He was a, a great defensive coordinator. Well, Chris, we've got just a couple more uh, minutes, but I, there's a couple of topics I did not want to let go by without talking with you about them. And I, the next one is – Name, image, and likeness. What's your take on that for the modern college athlete, regardless of sport? Do you like it? Do you hate it? What do you see? I mean, I like people being able to capitalize on, you know, something they've worked hard for and to be able to benefit from it and to be able to, because, you know, everybody else is making money off you or however you want to look at it. So, you know, but I think it's got to be controlled. I think you can't let it get out of hand. If you do, you're going to get back to the old days when it was just, you know, pay people this, pay people that. And, you know, you end up buying players. And, you know, I don't think that's a, a good thing. I think kids need to go to a school because they love the school. They love the coaching staff. They love the education. That's where they want to get a degree from. And I think we, you know, I think a lot of kids miss out on that. And that's unfortunate. I think, I think you're so, you're so right about that. You know, when you see, the quarterback of this team or the halfback of that team, and they hadn't even played. And yeah. they've got these huge deals that are being reported. I think that just kind of skews things so badly. Uh, maybe this is the old guy in me. Maybe I just don't like the what's what's coming and yeah. what's already here. Yeah. But I think you're so right, Chris. I think you got to earn it. You got to go to your school that you love and maybe the, the school that can best benefit you. Yeah. Now, let's talk about the modern game. The game, the game that we were playing in the 80s, high schools have exceeded that now. What about the modern game now? And by the way, Boo Mitchell says to tell you hello. What's up, Boo? Loved Boo. You had a lot of respect for him. Tough wide receiver, man. Tough. Uh, you know, the, the the way defense is played now, I am not a fan of at all. And I, it, it just – now, does it need to be that way? That's a whole different argument. I'm not saying, you know, it doesn't – you got to protect the players. I totally understand that. Mm -hmm. But from a football standpoint, I love the old school Jack Tatum, Ronnie Lott, take helmets off, hit them across the middle, anything you can do to get them down. That's the kind of football I love. It's hard for me to watch it sometimes now. I mean, just because, you know, the rules make it. If I were a free safety now, oh, my goodness, I would have a very difficult time. And I, I don't see how they – it's got to be hard learning to play that way. But I respect it, and I do think you have to have it that way because the whole uh, – my older brother, Greg, he's in that uh, NFL concussion study in Boston. He's one of them that, you know, short-term memory loss. And so I feel for that, and I know how important that is to protect the players, and I'm all for that. But if you ask me do I like the way the game is, uh, I don't. It's it's bigger, faster, stronger. Each generation gets that much yes. more, and it's it's so hard to to keep up with it. Yes, but guys, I could talk to Chris for the next two hours, and we will. Not Let's do it, man. Thing. Let's do it. Two more we, hours. We're going. I tell you what, we're going to have parts two and three sometime yes. in the coming months. Sounds the pride good. of Old Hickory, Tennessee. Yes, Chris James, thank you. Thirty-four, my friend. I cannot thank you enough for spending some time and taking us on your journey tonight.
Thank you. And Bernard, I, I, I said this to you off air. I want to say it on air. Thank you so much for what you're doing. It's unbelievable. And I know people love it. And this is a great thing, man. And you're be, to be commended for taking your time to do this. Thank you. You're most, most welcome, uh, Chris. But I promise you, the pleasure is all mine because I get to have these conversations every single week. Yeah. Now, I'm going to challenge every one of you to find Chris, to find me, to find your former teammates on Saturdays at Jess Neely. Yes. Did many former players, people part of the program. You've heard Coach Lee on this show say the best way that we can, we can support the program is showing up and showing the current team how much they mean to us, how much they mean to the school and to the program. So please keep showing up and anchor down. Thank you. Good night.